Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, the only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a narcotics detail. A steady flow of heroin has been making its way into your city. Most of it has fallen into the hands of teenagers. You don't know the source or the head man of the operation. Your job? Stop it. The modern way to sell cigarettes is the Chesterfield way. Premium quality in both regular and king size. And we're the only one that gives it to you. Premium quality in a cigarette means the world's best tobaccos, the best ingredients, the best cigarette paper. Only Chesterfield gives you this premium quality in both popular sizes. King size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king size cigarette. Well, that's certainly important to every king size smoker. Of course, it's the same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. There is absolutely no difference except that king-size Chesterfield gives you more than a fifth longer smoke. Yes, the modern way to sell cigarettes is the Chesterfield way. Premium quality, both regular and king-size. Chesterfield is much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, April 6th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of narcotics detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Kearney. My name's Friday. I'd just gotten off work, and I'd gotten a call from a friend who wanted to see me. It was 5.46 p.m. when I got to my apartment house. Apartment 12. Hi, Joe. Oh, Ed. Just getting ready to go in. Come on in. Got you. Go ahead. Thanks. Sit down. You you got a date or something? No, no, it's all right. I just thought I'd get something to eat and then maybe take in a show. What do you want to see me about? It's about Gary, Joe. Your boy? Yeah, I, I don't know quite how to say it. Yeah, well, you sounded pretty upset on the phone, Ed. I was, Joe. I still am. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, come on. What's it all about? It was all I could do to keep my hands off him. I never felt like that with anybody before, but I did with Gary. I wanted to strangle him. All right. Now, what's he done, Ed? He's a dope addict, Joe. Well, that's a pretty serious thing to say, Ed. Are you sure about that? I am now. First, I couldn't believe it, but tonight, Ellen and I went through his room. We found this. Here. Uh-huh. Open it. See? Mm-hmm. Looks like a layout. I couldn't find any drugs in it. I know that he's using them, though. Mm-hmm. Spoon, eyedropper, needle. Yeah, everything's here. What'd you find this, Ed? In his room. I had it hidden up on the shelf in his closet. I found it tonight. I didn't know what to do, Joe. Helen's been crying all day. She's almost out of her mind. You were the only one I could think of coming to. Who do you talk to when you find out your son's an addict? Well, now, Ed, are you sure this is his in the first place, that he's been using it? Yeah, I'm just... sure. I never would have believed it. Not Gary. There's no reason for it. We've given the kid everything he wanted. There's nothing he didn't have. Good home. Helen and I have always tried to understand his problems. Always looked at them like they were important. Everything. We gave him everything. Now this. I don't know what to do, Joe. I got no place to turn. There's nothing I can do. Maybe you can figure a way. Maybe you can't. I don't much care anymore. I, I, I just know that I can't see him again. Not for a while. I'm afraid, Joe. I'm real afraid. All right, now, let's take it easy, Ed. We'll work this out some way. You don't know what it's like, Joe. You can't uh, to feel like this and, and to know you'll do it. What? I see him again, Joe. I'm going to kill him. 
I'd known Ed Field for the past seven years. I'd met him when we were conducting an investigation while I was assigned to Bunko Division. His testimony had been instrumental in breaking up a gang of shoplifters. Since then, we'd become very good friends. He lived just down the street from my apartment, and on occasion, we got together for an evening. I knew his wife, and I'd met his 18-year-old son, Gary. The boy was a senior in high school, and as Ed had told me many times, his grades were well above average. The Field family was moderately well-to-do. Their home wasn't luxurious, but it was good-sized. To look at the boy, there was nothing that would cause anybody to think that he might be a user. 6.12 p.m., Field and I arrived at his home. Helen Field was waiting for us. She was a nice-looking woman in her early 40s. She let us in the house and showed us to the living room. It was obvious that she'd been crying. I don't know how to thank you for coming over, Joe. I guess Ed told you what it's all about. Yes, Helen. Did Gary home yet? No, I haven't heard a word from him since he left. I didn't tell Joe what happened this afternoon. Thought it'd be better if he got it from you. Oh, all right. You want to sit down, Joe? Sure. I'll sure. tell you. Thank you. Well... Gary came home this afternoon about 2.30. Mm -hmm. Walked into the house and went right to his room. He didn't say a thing to me. First, I thought that maybe he might be sick. I went to the room and he'd locked the door. I knocked, asked him if he was all right. Yeah. He called through the door that he was okay and for me to leave him alone. I asked him if there was anything I could do. You know, if he was sick, he might need something. I understand. What did he say? Told me to get away. To leave him alone and get off his back. Those were his exact words. Leave him alone and get off his back. Mm -hmm. About 20 minutes later, he unlocked the door and came out. He seemed to feel fine. He came over and kissed me and said he was sorry about what he'd said. He said that he hadn't been feeling well and that he'd said those things without meaning them. Mm -hmm. I told him that he ought to wait until I could take his temperature. He said there was nothing wrong me to get out of his way, that he had some business to take care of and be home for dinner. I tried to stop him from leaving, and he pushed me aside. He knocked me down. Get my hands on him, I'll teach him. He stood there for a minute, and I thought he was going to cry. But he just turned around and walked out. Were you any idea where he might have gone? what this business was that he was going to take care of? No, no, not the slightest idea. You can see what we're up against, Joe. I'm afraid to even see the boy. Yeah. When did you first figure that he might be using narcotics? When I came home, Helen told me what had happened. I thought about what would make the kid do a thing like this. The more I thought about it, the more there had to be only one reason. That's when Helen and I went through his room and found that kid. Mm -hmm. Has the boy been ill at all lately? Under a doctor's care? Something that you might not know about? No, no. I'm sure that if he was, we'd know about it. I want to see you, Gary. Yeah, I'll be right with him. I want to see you right now. We'll have to wait. Maybe there's something wrong with your ears, son. I'm not going to take that from you. Please, Ed, don't do something you're going to regret. Now listen, Helen, that boy's 18 years old. For all that time, we've done everything we could for him. We've given him a lot more than most boys his age have. I'm not going to stand by and see it all blow up just because he's a kid. That's no excuse. I want an answer for all this. What he's been doing, what happened this afternoon. I want those answers, and I want them now. Remember, he's only a boy. And I'm getting sick of that, too. Where is it? Now, listen, boy, I know what's been going on. I want to talk to you about it. I don't want you to lecture me. All I want to know is where's the kid. Take it easy, son. What are you doing here? I asked him to come over. You didn't turn me in, huh? Your dad asked me to come over to see if I could help here. I don't need nothing from you, cop. I want the layout. Where is it? You aren't going to use that anymore. I want the layout. I got to have it. Where is it? Please, Gary, don't get your father any more mad than he is. I don't care how sore he is or how sore he gets. I want the layout. I want it now. I can't think of any more simple way to say it. If I have to take it away from you, then I'll do it your way. You lousy bum. I'll teach you to talk to me. All right, take it easy, Gary. This isn't going to get you anywhere now. Come on, settle down, both of you. Get out of here. Get him out of here. Joe, I swear I'll break him in two. Please, then. Joe, do something. Let him go, let him go. It's about time he found out I'm old enough to call things my way. Go on, let him go. I'm not afraid of him. I'm not afraid of you either, cop. I'm not worried about anybody. All I want is that kit. Now, I gotta have it. I gotta. Now, give it to me and we can talk then. I gotta have it fixed. I gotta. Joe, do something, please. All right, come on, sit down. Sit down, boy. This has gone far enough here. Let's get a few things straight. You're not going to have any more of that. We'll see that a doctor looks at you. He'll do what he can, but you've had it. No more narcotics for you, and I'll face it. 
You want me to tell you where you stand? You're a user. Any way you slice it, this had to happen. I don't want anything from you. Why don't you just leave me alone? I can't do that. Let me see your arm. Come on, roll up your sleeve. Do what he says, Gary. Yeah. Both arms, huh? I'd take a joy pop once in a while. Now, don't con me, Gary. You got it bad, and it's going to get worse. You didn't get that arm from Chippy in with the stuff. The kit we found, you don't need to lay out that big to joy pop. You've been mainlining it for quite a while. I know it, and so do you. You holding now? Come on, boy, answer me. You holding now? Yeah. Well, let's have it. I'm not going to give it to you. You got no choice, son. Either give it to me or I'll take it. All right, here it is. How big a habit you got? Not big. How big? A couple of bucks. Now, come on, boy. Let's have a straight answer. Twenty-five a day? Twenty-five dollars a day. That's a lot of narcotics, isn't it? It's what it takes. Where's it come from? Come on. Who's your connection? You maybe got me, but I'm not going to be a fink. You got to let me go at that. I can't do that. Now, where'd you get this stuff? How about that doctor? You going to do something about we'll that? We'll talk to him. You know, talking to him ain't going to do any good. I got to have a fix. I'm going to fall apart. Come on, now, be a pal. Let me have a fix. I'll tell you all about it, then. You got the kit? You got the stuff? Come on, be a sport, No huh? go. You can't do it. Come on, let's go downtown. You're going to take him to jail, Joe? I'll take him down to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. The doctor can look at him there. We're going to have to hold him for a while, Miss Field. Why'd you do it, Gary? Why? Can't you tell me? Is it something your father and I have done? There's got to be a reason. What is it? Oh, please, Gary, tell me. Come on, let's get out of here. <laughs> Can we see him after he gets there, Joe? Yeah, I'll call the Ed. Don't you want to say goodbye to your mother, son? Why, I wouldn't prove anything. Yeah, I guess that's the way you'd look at it. I broke the law, now they're going to make a convict out of me. I didn't call him, you did. How are you going to explain that to her? You turn your own son in. How are you going to tell her about it? I hope you're real happy now. I'm not proud of it, son. There's one thing I'd like to ask. Yeah. What have you done to her? 8.30 p.m. I called Frank Smith and filled him in on what had happened. He said that he'd meet me at Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. I took young Gary Field down with me and had a doctor check him over. After that, the boy was taken to the narcotics division and Frank and I talked to him. I don't know how to tell you any better. There isn't any other way to say it. I'm not going to give you any names. That's not going to help you any, son. So it won't help me. It won't get any of my friends in trouble. Well, you've got great friends, haven't you? Now, where'd you get the money to take care of your habit? Gary? I earned it. Where? I worked. Where'd you work? Look, it's getting late. That stuff the doctor gave me didn't do any good. I still need a fix now. I'm getting sick. Do what you gotta do. Let's get this over with. Now, look, this is gonna be the same in the morning, son. We're gonna keep asking questions till you come up with the right answers. Look, cop, I don't want any favors from you. Now, leave me alone. We're only trying to help you, boy. Oh, get off my side. Now, I need nothing from you. You saw your duty and you did it. That makes you a big man, huh? I know you'll both make lieutenant. Now, beat it, All huh? right, that's enough of that. Now, there's a couple of things we'd like to set you straight on. Maybe help you to figure where you stand in this. Oh, here it comes. What do they do, give you a license to preach when they hand you the badge? That's enough of that, youngster. Come on, get off my back, cop. If my old man hadn't turned fit, you'd never have got me. Where are you going? I'm getting out of now here. Now, sit down. Sit down. All right, young fellow, you want to be a big man? That's the way it's going to be. I'm going to tell you that you get no special treatment here because I know your parents. You'll be treated just like any other user. You're getting a little of the edge because you're a youngster. There's not a pound of honesty or integrity in your distorted mind. The simple way would be to drop you in a cellar, let you sweat out the cure, let you fall apart if you had to. Let me tell you this. We're going to get the connection that's been supplying you, and then we're going to get the man behind him. I don't much care about them, but I do care about the kids around you. You've got a big habit. It takes a lot of money to keep up a habit like that. I've seen kids like you before, and there's only so many ways to get that money. You steal it or you start pushing narcotics yourself. I don't think you're stealing, so you've got to be pushing it. That means that you've probably got other kids hooked on it. Other youngsters that have got trouble because of you. Mules that are dragging your wagon for you. Your folks will maybe forgive you for what you've done to them, but they'll never be able to buy what you did to the other kids. You had a chance to help yourself and help the rest of them. You had a chance to do something good for somebody else and you wouldn't take it. Well, you're playing it smart, big boy. Keep playing it that way when you end up in a jail cell, will you? You through, cop? Yeah, I'm through. Fine, let me get some sleep, huh? Let's go, Frank. <laughs> You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Friends, you'll remember some months ago, we read you our first report, the six-month report on the effects of smoking. Then more recently, we read you the eight-month report. 
Now, here is the latest one. The full 10 months report confirms again. The group examined showed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. This from a medical specialist who is making regular, bi-monthly examinations of a group of people from various walks of life. 45% of them have smoked Chesterfield for an average of over 10 years. After 10 full months, the specialist reports he observed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfield. That's the report. Buy much milder Chesterfield, regular or king size. The cigarette that's best for you. Gary Field was taken to the main jail and booked. Frank and I went back to the office to fill out the arrest reports. The next day, Wednesday, April 7th, we began to talk to Gary's friends and teachers. From all of them, we got the same story. Until six months before, the boy had been a model student. He was always at the top scholastically in each of his classes. He was a member of several honorary student organizations and had twice been nominated for president of his class. Then, apparently without reason, the boy's personality had changed. He stopped taking an interest in his schoolwork. Several of his teachers told us that he wouldn't have gotten passing grades at the end of the semester. He dropped out of the service organizations at school. From some of his teachers, we got the names of his close friends. Talks with them netted us little. They told us that Gary had dropped out of the crowd of youngsters that he'd been running with and had taken up with new friends. They told us that they didn't see much of him after school, that he'd gotten into fights with other students on several occasions, and that after a period of time, they'd stopped asking him to their functions. None of them were able to give us the names of his new friends. We checked with the neighborhood merchants. Most of them knew Gary. They said that he'd worked for them after school, but they hadn't seen him for several months. We asked them if they could help us locate his friends. They told us that they had seen him in the company of one particular man on several occasions, but they couldn't identify him for us. We got a description of the man, but it meant nothing to us or to the other members of the narcotics division. Photographs of known narcotic suspects were shown to the parents of Gary Field and to the storekeepers around the school. They couldn't identify any of them. Two days passed. Friday, April 8th. We got a call from the field boy. Frank and I went over to see him. What do you want to see us about, Gary? I wanted to tell you I've had it. What's that mean? That I want to tell you about it. What's the matter? You been sick? A little. That's not why I called you, though. They treated me all right here, but I got to thinking. All right, go ahead. I used to read in the papers where the kids would turn themselves in or get caught and cop out. All about how they realized what they'd done. Always seemed like a lot of phony sob sister stuff. I know different now. I know what I've done. I know I've got to stand for it. And I'm, not, I'm not asking any favors, because I, I know that I've done nothing to call for. I'm not trying to be a hero or a martyr. I just want to help get this thing cleaned up. One thing I'd like to know, Gary. What's that? What made you get started on this stuff? You seem like a kid that has everything you want. You don't look like a kid who'd fall for it. Who knows? I'd give you a thousand reasons they still wouldn't add. I guess I just wanted to be top man all the way around. How'd you get on it? Started lushing it up, then the tea, then the heroin. That's the way it runs, isn't it? Most of the time. I didn't figure I'd ever be hooked. Thought it couldn't happen to me. <laughs> How wrong you can be. How long you had the big habit? About six months. Chippied with it about the same time before then. Where'd you get the money? Mm, guess we had to get to that, huh? That's right. Where'd you get it? Well, I got some kids pushing this stuff for me. Worked for a while. Wasn't enough. By that time, the kids were hooked themselves. I was the only connection they had. They had to do business with me or do without it. Yeah. I told them that if they couldn't pay me in cash, I'd take merchandise. They'd bring it. I'd sell it. That way we both came out all right. They got their H. I got mine. You mean you got them to steal, that it? Yeah, I guess so. I never asked where they got the stuff. I just took it and sold it. With that and the stuff they sold for me, I made out. These kids pushing H for you? No. Well, they're shoving tea. I sell it to them for four bits a stick. They get up to a buck and a half for it. You know where they peddle it? No, I never asked. All I was interested in was if I got mine. All right, give us their names, will you? Guess that's the only way, huh? That's the only way. Okay, I'll give them to you. How about your connection? Who's he? A guy named Jack. Jack who? I don't know. Honest, I really don't. Where'd you meet him? Drive in downtown. Where? Drive in at the corner of Reno and Vernon. How do you set up the meet? I just go in there between 10 and midnight, park the car and order coffee. He comes over to the car. You mean that he's always there at that time, huh? Usually is. So your only source? Yeah. Anyone else pushing it around there? No, as far as I know. I think he's the only one in the operation. All right, you'd be willing to arrange a meet with him so we can pick him up? Yeah, I'll do it. All right, fine. 
But you want to see the folks. I got so much to make up for. That's right, you have. Don't think I'll live long enough to do it all. 9.32 a.m. We got a description of the suspect known as Jack and also the names and addresses of the teenagers involved. Frank and I contacted the juvenile authorities and gave them the information. We went back to our office and had Gary Field check our files of known narcotic suspects. He was unable to give us an identification on Jack. 11.56 a.m. We took the boy to his home and talked with his parents. 12.30 p.m. Frank, Gary Field, and I drove to the corner of Vernon and Reno to check over the drive-in restaurant. It was set up in the usual way with a parking area around the main building for car service. In the rear of the lot was a building housing a cocktail bar, and there were parking spaces in front of that for the bar customers. As we drove past the place, Gary told us that he usually parked around the side of the main building and that this jack came from the direction of the bar. He was unable to tell us whether the suspect drove a car or not. The plan was for Gary to introduce me as a narcotics buyer who was trying to get a local connection. It was agreed that because of the size of the buy I was to make, it would be necessary for me to deal with the head of the organization. 11.05 p.m., Gary and I got into my car and we drove to the drive-in. Frank followed us in a police unit. We arrived at the meet at 11.14 p.m. Frank stayed in the background and we waited. The suspect failed to make an appearance. The next night, the plan was repeated. Again, nothing. Sunday, April 10th, 10.05 p.m. We arrived at the drive-in. We waited. 11.05 p.m., 11.15, 11.30. No sign of the suspect. Midnight, 12.04 p.m. Looks like he isn't going to be here. I thought you said he usually showed up, didn't you? I don't know what happened. He was always here before. You sure you got the right drive-in? Look, Mr. Friday, I know what you're thinking, but I'm telling the truth. Yeah, you know, all this is kind of tough to buy, don't you? Three nights and he isn't here. I don't understand. He was always here before. Wait a minute. Yeah? Hold it. Yeah, that's him, coming over from the bar. All right, which one? There's a couple of people coming out the there. The big one. See in the gray suit, the hat? Yeah. You sure that's this Jack? Positive, Mr. Friday. All right, now you look. You know what you're going to do. Don't let on that anything's wrong here. Remember that nothing's going to happen to you. I'll remember. All right, now hold on. He's coming over. Hi, kid. Hi, Jack. I've been looking for you. Where you been? All right. Who's a friend? Oh, yeah. I want to talk to you about him. He wants to do business with you. What are you talking about? What business? Look, Jack, he's all right. I know it. You think I'd have brought him here if I didn't know what? Oh, he's all right. He's a friend of yours. You know the bit. Any friend of yours? I don't know what to talk about businesses. I don't know what you're doing here, but I'm here for a cup of coffee. Better let me talk to him alone. You're trying to prove bringing the guy here. Who is he? Friend of mine. I told you once. I told you a thousand times. Don't ever bring nobody with you. Haven't I told you, huh? Oh, yeah, but he's okay. He wants to make a buy, a big one. Crazy kid. You told him about it? Look, he's okay. I know it. Look, Jack, we both stand to do all right from this. I kind of figured if he bought from you, you might give me a little piece of it. You know, sort of say thanks for the business. How long you known this guy? Long time. How long? A couple of years. How come I never seen him before? He doesn't hang around this part of town. What's he doing here now? Like I said, trying to make a buy. Where'd you meet him? Before I met you, I used to buy stuff from him. He moved out of town, went up north, does business up there. Last couple of days, I couldn't get in touch with you. I ran into him, he fixed me up. Then he told me he wanted to buy. Right away, I thought of you. All right, I'll talk to him. But I ain't making no deal. You just talk to him. You'll find out everything's okay. All right. You let me do the talking. Joe, this is Jack, the fellow I was telling you about. Hi. Hi. Kidder tells me you're down on business, all right? Yeah, I'm looking around. Nice place, L.A. A lot of business to do here. What line you? Whatever pays me. Where you from? Up north. Mm-hmm. How long you known Gary here? Now, you listen to me. I haven't got all night to stand around here and guzzle his stale coffee with you. The kid told you what I want. Now, it boils down to one simple question. You want to do business or don't you? Going kind of fast, aren't you? I haven't got a lot of time. I don't like to deal that way. All right, kid, let's get out of here. Should have known better than to figure on dealing with a small-time operator. I told you that before. What do you mean by that? You read it any way you want. Well, let's go, son. See you around, mister. Hey, uh, hold on. No need to get sore about it. Just have to be careful. You know how it is. Now, you listen. I was shoving horse when you were playing with marbles. I've outgrown the kid games. I thought I could make a buy. I see I was wrong. Maybe not. What? I said maybe we could do business. I gotta have it tonight. How much you need? 
I need an ounce. It's got to be good. Mm-hmm. I haven't got that much with me. How much have you got? I only got 12 bindles with me. How much? You got to understand, this is good stuff. How much? Now, look, this is better than you can find any place else. All right, let's quit playing, huh? What's the tab on it? Ten bucks a bindle. All right, I'll take the 12. How soon can you have the rest of it? When do you want it? I told you I was in a hurry. Don't you hear good? Yeah, maybe tomorrow night. All right, that'll have to do. If it's good quality, I may want some more. How much can you supply? How much do you need? Oh, I'll go maybe another ounce. Mm -hmm. You got the cash for this? I don't do business any other way. Uh-huh. Wait here, I'll be back. It's all right, isn't it, Mr. Frank? Yeah, Gary, everything's fine. You see where he's going? No, it's too dark. Don't you worry about it. Frank will see where he goes. I'll be glad when this is over. All right, hold it. Okay, mister, let's see the money. I got it right here. Let's see the horse. You got it? All right, looks all right. Here. You don't mind if I count this? No, I'll go right ahead. It's all there. 120 bucks, isn't mm -hmm. that what you said? Just to make sure. Yeah. 50, 70, 90, 110, 120. Yeah, right, it's all here. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll see you tomorrow night, huh? Yeah, sure. I'll tell you, it's nice to do business with you. Been a real pleasure, a real pleasure. Well, that works both ways, mister. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope to see a lot more of you. You will. You're under arrest. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 29th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. In 1952, American smokers bought more Chesterfields than ever before in the history of the industry. Today, sales continue to mount for two big reasons. Chesterfield is the first and only cigarette to give you premium quality in both regular and king size. Only Chesterfield gives you this scientific evidence on the effects of smoking. As we told you earlier, after 10 months, the group examined showed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. Change to Chesterfield yourself. Regular or king size, Chesterfield is much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Gary Richard Field, because of his cooperation, was placed in a hospital for rehabilitation and at the conclusion of his treatment was placed on three years probation. The other juveniles involved were handled through the juvenile court and received sentences comparable with his. Jack Alexander Williams was tried and found guilty of violation of the State Narcotic Act, a felony, and was sentenced to the state penitentiary for the term as prescribed by law. Violation of the State Narcotic Act, a felony, is punishable by imprisonment for a period of not more than six years in a state prison. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Harry Bartell, Virginia Gregg, Eddie Firestone. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show Tuesday night on the same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield, either regular or king size. You'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. <laughs> Tonight, it's Adventure with Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator on NBC.